pase, pierna derecha, directo al arco, golazo, golazo, golazo. The world of football with a soccer perspective. This is Soccer Today with Dwayne Mullins and Kevin Laramie, live on the Sports Podcasting Network. Good day, good night, and welcome to Soccer Today for Tuesday, October 23rd. 2018 happy birthday to Pele still to this day the only player to win three world cups Dwayne. three world cups and um he scored a thousand goals apparently uh yeah it's yeah, uh that, you know. that's an inflated stat i think yeah i mean there's a a few of them out there it's hard when back then the stats weren't quite there but certainly uh what you know, there was I'm no not... opta you think there was no opta in the 60s what are you talking no, about? No option, no option back then. Um, I am um, not old enough to remember Pele playing, so even some even some players predate old Dwayne, Kevin. Oh wow, That's, yeah, black and white back then, right? I guess so. Uh, yeah, yeah no, I do not remember the seventies. I cannot remember. I remember the NASL vaguely, but I don't remember when he was playing in it. Tuesday, Champions League is back today. But before we go to the Champions League, it's kind of a year up. European Tuesday, so we'll talk about Champions League, we'll talk about Premier League, we'll review the Premier League weekend quickly, and uh, a couple of very interesting games, especially the first one, Saturday morning, Dwayne, <laughs> 2 2. Oh, don't you just love Ross Barkley scoring in the 93rd minute and Marino getting so mad at an assistant that he almost gets up to fight him? This is, um, and he's already uh, on short leash because of the, he, you know, the those words that he said following the Spurs game were, um, I, you know, we, we are somewhat, we can swear on this, this show, but I'm not going to repeat the, the translation of it. You can find it easy enough. Um, yeah, look, the, the, I forget the gentleman's name from Chelsea. He's one of the backroom staff decided to yeah. get in Mourinho's face. The funny thing about it was that he got it right in his face the first time and Mourinho <laughs> didn't even notice. And then the second time something snapped. But, you know, the the, the theory is that what snapped was him realizing, oh, here's an opportunity for me to take away from the attention that United just allowed or just dropped two points. Yeah, again. (laughs) That's that's his M.O., right? That's the Moo's M.O. is to deflect attention from his player conceding late in the game and put it all on himself. We've seen this movie before. Yeah, and look, I mean, if you want to go back to the game, we talk about Reno a lot because he's such a character. Like it's the <laughs> it's, it's cartoon. You know, it's it's Coronation Street's the longest running soap opera, of course, in, <laughs> in the UK. But this is getting close at this point, right? Like he, he is a, a soap opera in there. I mean, it's a there was a lot going on with that game. There always was his return to Chelsea. Obviously, Mourinho, when he looked back, when his when his best selling autobiography is written uh, at the end of his career, which I think he already has a book out. But when there's the you know the follow up, <laughs> the, uh, the next chapter, uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the chapters about the Chelsea time are going to be the ones that, that are, you know, the pinnacle. That's going to be the, the peak of his performance. And, you know, I, I would suggest that that when um, when they won that Champions League, Chelsea did play in the way that they did, uh, which, you know, came against the flow of what you would have expected from both Chelsea and the Champions League that year. That's probably, that was peak Mourinho. That was, that was when he started to, you know, started to leap over the shark so to speak right uh but at that moment he was still on the on the proper side of the shark not yet jumping it and and now we're you know we're talking about the sideshow of him uh, we're talking about him in united where i don't know i don't know if he knows what to do i don't know if he is a guy that you know we joke about the three-year thing but there's some truth to it in the sense that he doesn't seem to know how to be a long-term presence at a club because he's too caught up in the character <laughs> the caricature of, of, <laughs> of himself. Jose Mourinho. Yeah. yeah, but you know what it takes for longevity in a, in a position? It takes composure. It, it takes humility because you need to evolve, right? The only reason you can be Arsene Wenger or Sir Alex Ferguson is. To understand that every few years you gotta change your setup, you gotta change your app, your approach as a manager, but you have to change tactics as well. Because if you don't move forward, if you stay still, the world catches you by and then goes ahead of you. And it's exactly what we always see with Marino's three-year jinx: is that the third year other teams figured it out, and they're not having as good season yeah well and you got to pick your battles too i mean i think if you look at at fergie uh for instance uh you know and 
sit down. I'm about to say positive things about Alex Ferguson here. I, what he did brilliantly is he he knew when to be the hairblower guy in the dressing room. He knew when to be the meanie, and he knew when to sort of step back and just try to in a positive way for his players and, and to create that loyalty around him. He does have, or you know, you can say many things about Alex Ferguson about those United. You know, those glory days of United, which we are now are on the other side of. Clearly, that's a club that has not been able to completely figure itself back out since he left. Um, those players are insanely loyal to both Manchester United as a club and to Alex Ferguson as, as a man. Um, and, and that means he was doing something internally right there, even though he, when he was throwing them up, he, he threw them under the bus strategically. But you suspect that behind closed doors, he was saying other things. I don't think Marino does that. I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> That's true. That Marino throws them under the bus, but doesn't warn them either before or after of why. And then he gets into the bus and backs back over them for a second time sometimes. <laughs> like, like, make that's... sure you run over him good. <laughs> beep, beep, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and, and look, the, he's with Mourinho, with Ferguson, I think that the players understood that his his show, when he was putting a show on, was about protecting the club, about protecting the badge, about protecting the, the reputation of Manchester United. It was always about the club with Mourinho. It's about Mourinho. Yeah. The brand he's protecting yeah. is Mourinho. It's his own. Yeah. Yep. Anyways, that was an interesting matchup, and it finished 2-2, and Chelsea still unbeaten this year so far in the Premier League. West Ham, Tottenham. Tottenham getting the 1-0 win away in Olympic Stadium. Oh, sorry, London Stadium. The same damn stadium. <laughs> <laughs> Brighton, Newcastle. one nothing. Brighton. Brighton getting a valuable victory on the road. Newcastle, bottom of the league. Two points, yeah. Newcastle is a, a story in, a, in all the wrong ways this year, and we talked a lot about how the bottom of this league, Huddersfield, um, Fulham, uh, which I thought whole Fulham would be better. If you listen to our preview show, I had them as, as potentially finishing in, up as high as seventh. I had them because I thought they, I liked what they were doing last year. But we'll save the rest of the thoughts until we get to Fulham. But uh, yeah, but yeah, Newcastle is is a bit of a disaster. And I think uh, Benitez is uh, slowly quitting. At least the passion is gone for Newcastle. Uh, with the owner, well, Mike Ashley, not bringing any funds and actually want to make money off transfer window. You cannot make money in the transfer window in the Premier League if you want to stay up. It's like uh, it's like a given. Yeah, and look, and look, I mean, I've done the analogy many, many times before. And I, I you know, lived in and around Toronto my whole life. It reminds me a great deal of the bad old days of Maple Leaf Sports Cliff and Entertainment Fletcher. when <laughs> right. when the profit driven was going on. I mean they've changed. That company is completely different. Oh, yeah. You know, it's the same name, but it's completely differently owned now. And they really, you know, if you look at the success of the Raptors and the Leafs right now, it's hard to argue that they're they're like that. But back in the day, that's that's what they were known as is they were a team that made money and and just seemed only interested in that. And especially if you go way back before MLSC and into the Harrow Ballard years, that's a better analogy with what you got in Newcastle yeah. right now. So yes, you've got uh, your Harold Beller character. If you don't know if you're a, a foreign listener or an American listener, not familiar with hockey, Harold Beller was, uh, I guess, Al Davis might be the best analogy, maybe, <laughs> yeah. only with it's even true. less success. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, exactly. Bournemouth, yeah. Southampton, 0-0. Zero, zero. Cardiff 4, Fulham 2. Cardiff gets a win. Cardiff wins at home in the Premier League. That's a shocker. Yeah. And look, and that is a massive win for Cardiff. Uh, we have, I have suggested they were one of the worst teams I've seen in the Premier League. I still hold on to that. Fulham, you know, and the, I listen to, as I say every week, I, I do listen to a lot of European opinion. So I'm influenced cl clearly by it. And, and what they're saying, for those that don't listen to it, is that Fulham does look, still look very good going forward, but they just aren't adjusting to the Premier League. They're not willing or they're too proud or something of the way that they play to sort of be pragmatic. And what we're seeing, you know, they had a lead in that game. And when you have a lead against the team like Cardiff, you got to close them out. Otherwise, you're just going straight back down. It doesn't matter how pretty you're playing. You're, you know, you don't look pretty when you're going down, right? <laughs> Nothing looks pretty on your way to relegation. Yeah, exactly. So they, they need to figure that out. And, then, you know, the other side I hear about this is that, you know, this could be a prime job for one of the specialists, you know, one of those notorious old names that comes Aww. in and stabilize ships. Because Don't tell me they, Allardyce is going to come back and this time with Fulham. 
Well, he might, <laughs> or a guy like that, because, you know, David Moyes even, like someone that could just play pragmatically straight ahead, what it says in the box is what you get kind of football, because they do have enough attacking talent that you would think that if they could stabilize the back and form, that they should be able to squeak out, because that is none, it's going to be a crawl to the finish line when you're talking about the relegation teams down there. So you just get a couple wins in a row, and you're going to be back up above, you know, you're going to be above water again. That's so. True. Something's got to happen soon, though, because that's that's a team that did brilliantly in the championship last year, but has not adjusted itself at all into its uh, its leap up to the Premier League. And good for Cardiff, though. We're not talking yeah. about them, but when you're Cardiff, you take what you get, and this <laughs> is just an opportunity. They at least at least they know now that they're going to finish with at least one win this year. That's like true. they'd like to beat someone that they weren't playing last year as well, but but we'll see down the line. Battle of the W's, two teams that we both, Dwayne and I, see highly, at least probably above the top ten. In the top ten, above that mark, uh, Wolves and Watford. Watford two, Wolves zero. Watford on the road, getting the big victory. Yeah, and they had been sort of after a great start, kind of come back to a normal level, and so that was a, um, you know, a marker I think for them because I think a lot of people going into that game would have thought that Wolves might have been able to to pull that off, but but I think both those teams, as you say, are, are going to be safe, and they're sort of that they are the mid table. We've been talking a lot yes. about how there is no mid table in the Premier League this year. Well, maybe we're finding one: Everton, Wolves, Watford. That's your mid table. Yeah, Leicester. Probably. Yeah, Leicester's a perennial mid-table team. Uh, one team that we usually think is mid-table is the mid-table in the Premier League. Uh, now this time, Man City 5, burned Lee 0. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's their third 5 no win of the year. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, what are you going to say about that? It's, eh, yeah. They're the favorites, and they're they're, you know... They played pragmatically against Liverpool, which was something we've never seen from Pep in the Premier League before. But after, you know, Liverpool handed it to them last year, other than the, the game where they had the red card early, it was Liverpool dominated that series. So Pep demonstrated some, you know, we're still talking about the Liverpool. What are you going to talk about 5 nil? So I might as well talk about Liverpool more. It's, you know, he showed some pragmatism, which which I think is probably should terrify uh, other teams in the Premier League, considering they have three 5 nil wins this year. The other thing that should terrify Premier League teams this year is uh, Kevin Bryant made his return to the lineup. already so, that um, was so quick like people thought it was going to be a four to six months injury he's back in within, within two yeah and uh and they could afford to not push him either they got him out and i think it was the 56th or 57th minute of that game I'm on, i was in montreal so i was only sort of watching it on my phone so it wasn't that you know wasn't that stressful <laughs> what, for what's me, that but... what's that little red dot oh yeah that's the brian that's the brian's head he's back yeah <laughs> Especially my iPhone 5 with a cracked screen. But uh, nonetheless, <laughs> okay. if anyone wants to donate to patreon.com, I could buy a new phone. No, that's, that's why I would. <laughs> iPhone 5, yeah, exactly. Who needs that? Yeah, ha that's half of them. That's half ago, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> half ago. Uddersfield, Liverpool. That, that's what's frightening, dear, uh, Dwayne. 5 nothing Man City, Burnley. 1 nothing Liverpool on the road against Huddersfield, which is touted as one of the worst team in the Premier League this year. Yeah, there's a disparity there. Yeah, and the injuries are mounting up, and, and Mo Salah is nowhere near the form that he was at times last year. Which makes me um, wonder I, a lot about Mo Salah last year. When we have performances like this, outliers, what was going so right last year for Mo Salah that is not this year, and we're not the years before? I'm wondering. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not insinuating anything. I just... It's weird. It's what was it? Is his confidence was it that high that he could do no wrong? And this year's not because of Ramos and because of the World Cup. I don't know. Someone pointed out that he got on his hot streak immediately following the international break. It was a year ago this time that Egypt qualified for the World Cup, and he of course scored the penalty late in that game, which qualified them for them. And that. Um, set him off on a great stream. So it might be that simple. There could also just be, I mean, I'm going to use the L word here, the dirty L word, lock. There could have been some lock involved in this form as well, right? <laughs> That's not um, where I thought you were going. Like L. Yeah, what well, drug starts with L? <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, it's lock. He could have had some luck. Look, no one wants to talk about luck in sports. He's still, he's also been beat up too. He's been playing a lot of football. True. Right. And he got hurt in the Champions League final and he hasn't really performed since. He certainly didn't have much of a World Cup, although he was pushing himself to try and compete in that World Cup. And maybe he would he have been better no, off being shut down. He was nowhere so, near ready, though. We all know that. Yeah. 
and and that's just what it took his his heel time away, and then he gets beat up a little bit again playing for Egypt. I get where you know, although I don't agree with Klopp's sentiment around the Nations League, I do understand his frustration when he comes to watching his best players get hurt internationally. The international managers need to have a little bit of um wherewithal, a little bit of uh, insight into what they're doing with their top players because it's going to hurt them too if he's hurt for yeah. long term. But I, you don't need to play uh, the example. You don't need to make him play ninety minutes against a team like Dominica or. Lichtenstein, if you don't have to, you know, <laughs> why yeah. overextend those players? Yeah, well, and of course, Egypt's not in a nation's league, it's an African country, but yeah. e- exactly. So they're playing friendlies at this point in time. See, this is the pressure that you have when you're a guy like Mosala playing with Egypt's a decent side, but they're still Egypt, right? They're, they're still a, a decent side really nice. with Salah, Dwayne. Without Salah, they're a side. Yeah, and they're kind of that 30, 50, 60 world ranking kind of range. They've had glory times they've had less glory times but when you have a superstar like that and and you know we're, we're here in canada we're we're going to be coming into an era when we're going to have a guy playing it you know perhaps a <laughs> guy playing at barcelona and perhaps a guy playing at, uh, at Bayern munich that we might be like leaning on too heavily and it's important to sort of have a, like some perception about perspective i should say about who you're playing and sometimes and Liverpool. not lean on them so much yeah and juventus hopefully well i think i think Mr. Liam uh, might he, he's on the he's on Liverpool's books, but I think it's going to be a while before he's at Liverpool proper. We might see him at Rangers next year. It would shock me if we see him at Rangers next year. So there you true, go. True, true. Steven Gerrard um, did like him a lot. So yeah, the, there's a certain sense to a loan to Rangers for for Miller. Uh, Gerard, so yeah. so we'll see about that. Everton Crystal Palace. Oh, what a what a heartbreaker for Crystal Palace. Neil Neil late in the game then. 30 minutes, uh, 30 seconds of brilliance, Everton 2, Crystal Palace 0. The Eagles might have deserved better. Yeah, they missed a penalty in that one, too. Uh, kind of a one-dimensional attack that uh, Crystal Palace has going on right now. But they, they should have enough to stay up, you would think. But, uh, but kind of, you know, we always joke about how the you know Colorado Rapids and MLS are the forgotten team in, in MLS. If you Crystal list Palace the 20 teams in the Premier Rapids. League, I bet you Crystal Palace <laughs> might be one of them that you forgot. And they have Roy Austin. Roy, Roy Hodgson yeah. as the coach, too, who seems like he's 200 years old. Arsenal Leicester, the game yesterday, 3 1, a beautiful goal by Obama Young. Since joining Arsenal, Obama Young has uh, played 22 games and has been involved quietly in 21 goals. Not too shabby for Pierre Emerick Obama Young. 10 games undefeated in all competitions for Arsenal as well. Uh, that's the more important thing. They seem to be responding to Emery's coaching. They seem to, um, whatever malaise that was holding them back over the past few years, and uh, that malaise might have had the initials AW attached to it. Who, who's to know? Um, uh, but, burger? Uh, yeah. Talking about burgers here? AW? Yeah. Hungry. Yes, exactly. AW, yeah, they've got the. I tried the AW, that meatless burger at the AW the yeah, other day. Yeah, Beyond Burger, Beyond Meat. You know, the quick aparte here. That's a very <laughs> popular product in the States, and AW bought the rights of the Beyond Meat for Canada, so you can't find it in stores. But apparently, it tastes like meat, and there's a right texture. I'm not a very yeah. vegan, I haven't tried it, but apparently, it's actually really good. Yeah, I, I actually, you no, know, that would be my comment. I would like a veggie burger. I like a good veggie burger because it's a little healthier, right? Um, and uh, that one tasted, uh, it tasted like beef to me. So there you go. If you're in AW, um, which have, to, you know what AW is all about, Kevin? Root beer. You're gonna throw all the health out the with well, the root beer. I love the root beer, but you're gonna throw all the health out the window because what AW is all about is those onion, those onion rings. Oh, oh yeah, those onion rings are so fresh good. made onion rings with the with a root beer float. You know me and my nostalgia. Love diners and love. Uh, let a, a good root beer float. Well, what's better than root beer and vanilla ice cream? Yeah. And Arsenal fans are loving this conversation. We started talking about Arsenal. We ended up talking about burgers and root beer floats. But at any well, rate. Well, you know, that's um, what happens because the mayonnaise is sticking together. It's gelling in Arsenal. So it all comes down to food. Uh, and I think, look, I mean, you look at the two games that they lost off the hop, which is City, their first game of the year, first coach, that, that was always going to be tough for them. But it was only 2-0 if memory serves. Um, and then they lose to Chelsea the next week, and they, they I think it was 3-2 that game. So it wasn't like they got blown off the off the pitch in either of those, but everyone was like, oh, same old Arsenal after those two games. And then they quietly have sort of got down to business. And, and this is a team that I think is legitimate, especially with United not really doing very well this year. Um, absolutely. And... Spurs, although they're winning, 
they don't it'll be interesting in Spurs City this weekend we'll talk about this on Friday a little bit it, it, that's a real big test for Spurs because even though they've been doing okay they're getting points they haven't seemed as good as they have the last uh, they, as good no. as they played the last couple of years haven't this year so this is going to be a real test for them this you weekend. know why because they signed as many players in the offseason as I did yeah precisely and they like to spin that as if that's a positive like they were confident in their group and all that but yeah. really just... no it means your target fell through Means you didn't sign your target because you're gonna tell me you didn't have any targets? Come on, man. Yeah, when the champions in City, and I'm not trying to make this city centric, but they are the champions, went out and added to their pieces, made themselves stronger in positions they felt they needed to get stronger. It's hard to argue that the team that finished fourth shouldn't do the same thing. Yeah, um, so yeah, precisely. But the point, but the, to draw back to Arsenal, their rival, obviously, I, I right now, if you're you know asking me to pick who I think the top four are going to be. I'm including Arsenal in as the fourth team right now, just in, in, based on the form that they're having. And it's good to see. I mean, I've never I've always had a bit of a soft spot for Arsenal amongst the big clubs that aren't mine. And um, I have a lot of friends who are Arsenal friends, so maybe that's what that comes from. But uh, I, I think that uh, this is a club that's so much potential there, too, in terms of the, yeah. the amount of state, the size of their stadium, the ticket prices they're able to get in that part of London, the fact that it's a London club, the fact that it has history and success, successful history. That there's so much potential at Arsenal that has that sort of kind of fell behind the last few years. Yeah, but the, a lot of I was going to say the blue collar history of where the club comes from, too. Like yeah, uh, it, his links to the military a long time ago, his links to blue collar workers, you know, from where they stand, they stem from in the early 1900s. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of potential there, and yeah. it, it's going to get. It's one of the biggest clubs in the world, uh, and you know, it's not a club where it antagonizes a lot of people. It's not like United and City, right? The Gunners are like, yes, they're Spurs and they're big, big rivals, but even other London team, like I'm a Chelsea supporter, and I'm never angry at Arsenal, even though it's a London team. And is so it, they don't have the same aura as Chelsea with the big money Abramovich, which they're hated. It's the Gunners. It's not the same. It's like they grew organically to the point where they are now. Yeah, they're massive in, outside of England, too. And there's a couple factors on that, both when the Premier League uh, started to, to grow internationally was corresponded with the era in which Arsenal was at its best, their perfect season and uh, their perfect season, our defeated season there, uh, when they were the, you know, Henri and they were scoring goals for fun and it was just a, a beautiful play and beautiful football. And also around that time or a few years before the, the famous book Fever Pitch, which then was made into a, a, a half decent uh, romantic comedy British movie and an absolute terrible, terrible remake baseball based around movie. the Boston, Boston <laughs> movie. Um, yeah, th that came out. But it, th that fever pitch does actually play a role in terms of its popularity outside of England as well. So, yeah, it, it's a club with just an immense amount of, of um, potential for sure. You know, it's potential that it's fulfilled in the past, but it, potential to get back there is what I'm saying. Now, moving away from the Premier League, let's move to the Champions League. But before we talk about the Champions League, we'll take a small detour to Spain to talk about Real Madrid and Julian Lopetegui. Yeah, seventh for Madrid. The Galacticos, that's not going to fly, Dwayne. And they're facing Victoria Pleasant. They should win today. But if they lose at a Clasico, which they probably will, even with no Messi, uh, bye-bye, Julian. Yeah, well, probably. Uh, all the quick aside, Victoria Pleasant, have you ever seen their uh, their dugouts? Because their Pleasant yeah. means Pilsner in Czech, and they actually their dugouts are like half of a carved out tall boy beer can. Anyway. Nice. Um, <laughs> There you go. They're they're great. Uh, so anyway, but yeah, to get back to the Real Madrid situation, absolutely. I mean, he this is a and how, how quick, name me another manager whose reputation went from the top of the mountain <laughs> to the bottom of the mountain so quickly. I'm gonna manage Spain. I'm gonna win the World Cup, and then I'm gonna go to Real Madrid. No, no, no. You you sign with Madrid too early. You're out of the team in the World Cup. Who who, who fires their manager during the World Cup, and then yeah. starts with a blub, with a dub of a season, a blub of terrible beginning of a season. And it was four days before the World Cup. It's not quite in. <laughs> yes, we and they, he was shows. he was there though, right? He was in Russia training with the team. For me, it was like he was there just so early. It was so weird. I think that that was when the, when the day he was fired was the day we started our daily shows. <laughs> so there you go. Um, yes. Uh, well, we've been daily shows, including the weekend is what I mean. If you don't, if you're new to us for some reason, yeah. since the World Cup, we, we went through the weekend and the World Cup too. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, Real Madrid, I, look, things are going to balance themselves out. I, I have suspicions that Espanol is not going to finish second as they currently stand right now. Which <laughs> well, is, there's a good chance. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's probably going to even itself out a little bit. But but the, the last time El Clasico had this much, I don't know, maybe it has more intrigue because first off, you have Real Madrid playing the way they're doing. Um, Barcelona's been okay, but they haven't been spectacular. And then, of course, Messi, after, you know, does some brilliance and then breaks his arm. Which, you know, everyone in Spain's going, I just need an arm, it's messy. Could, could, we always he can play question. with no arms. Just, just chop it yeah. off. He'll still be good. Exactly. But uh, but it's going to be a weird El Clasico. And some people were saying, some people are saying, that the worst thing that can happen to Real Madrid is they win this thing in some ways because they want to make the change. And if, you, if they win it, then it's hard. There's so much emotion behind El Clasico that, that, yeah, they can't fire a manager if he immediately wins that. But if he loses it, especially if he loses it big, it's like I don't even think he'd make it out of the stadium. He might fire him a half time. <laughs> They're gonna call him on when he walks towards his car, like, "Oh, well, Julian, we we forgot to tell you." Yeah, you're fired. Yeah, he just tried to get out of the parking lot. His parking pass won't work. He's so like, can, <laughs> "Why can't I get? Why can't I get out? What's why is the gate not opening? Why is there a guy coming behind me with a box with what seems all my personal effects?" What's going on? Let me just get that gate for you. <laughs> Let me get that gate for you, out. and here's your box. Here's your stuff. You're not welcome here anymore. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting times. Look, look, people that have followed this, and I like the Spanish league, and I like the Spanish league even when it's dominated by two teams with a half team, sort of, whether it's Valencia or whether it's Atletico, depending on the year, sort of, you know, grabbing at their heels. Um, I still like it, but this year, right now, at least at the start, it, it has added some intrigue, and it's uh, certainly. Um, both in Germany as well with the play of uh, Bayern Munich. It's, it's yeah. been interesting to start the season outside of this. Atletico Madrid might win the Liga this year. Yeah, oh, yeah well, yeah, I, that, certainly their best chance. I, I still think it's Barcelona that's going to win it. But, um, you know, if I'm going to be a betting man, well, if I'm a betting man, I'm not betting with value if I'm betting in Barca. Yeah, you're just betting with a sure thing. Now, yeah. moving to the Champions League to finish the show today. Eight games on the docket for this Tuesday, eight games tomorrow. We talked about Real Madrid. They play at 3 p.m. today, uh, Eastern Time, versus Victoria Plazen at the Santiago Bernabeu Stadium in Madrid. We've got Ajax from Greece versus Bayern Munich at home in Greece. Young Boys from Sweden versus Valencia of La Liga. Ajax from the Eredivisie in the Netherlands from Amsterdam versus Benfica. That's a, you know, that's a 90s matchup right there. Ajax Benfica, that's a classic from like 1994. Yeah, you can almost see the like uh, SD standard uh, um, tape delayed uh, coverage of it, can't you? <laughs> or that's the highlight package. You know? Yeah, exactly. There are people gathered in well, where I used to live in Toronto uh, at some bar that that uh, only serves uh, serves you in Portuguese. Uh, at uh, you have to knock twice at the top door and hand them twenty dollars. Yes, that's like, that's the kind of matchup that you used to have to <laughs> that you would watch in that kind of environment. And I'm going to skip over the game that we all going to talk about in a second. Offenheim Lyon. Lyon has to get that win because they started the Champions League with an amazing win against Man City. Then a dud of a game against Shakhtar Donetsk and now they have to get that win against Offenheim to to try to push City at least for the top of that group yeah Offenheim played well against City too their I mean, manager I'm telling you like that that kid's gonna manage Bayern Munich before long and uh, he's still doing a good job at Hoffenheim oh no absolutely he'll be in Bayern Munich probably by next year um, I think but uh, yeah so it, 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 I don't sleep on them they are I think probably the the bottom of that group just because I see Shakhtar with their home advantage is, is going to be difficult to maybe uh, battle off for third but uh, but yeah look because of that first the Lyon victory over City that group suddenly became very interesting a lot of people sort of had mailed it in for City um, I you know have too long with them to have done that but uh, certainly it's it, um, it's a big game in that group, both of those games, because I think you're going to have a lot better idea of whether it's going to go closer to chalk or whether it's going to be wide open till the end based on the results you see yeah. today. And after beating Real Madrid in the last match day, can CSK Moscow pull the, pull, pull the trick again of beating a top club at their own home? CSK Moscow goes to Roma, goes to Rome to, 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 to battle AS Roma. Man City, Shakhtar Donetsk, of course, on the road in uh, Donetsk. It's not in Donetsk, I know. Donetsk, Shakhtar Donetsk has been homeless for the last few years since the 
Crimea, Ukraine, Russia situation. So we all know what's going on there. But Man City on the road. And the one game everyone's talking about since the beginning of the Champions League, since the group stage draw, Cristiano Ronaldo and Juventus traveling to Old Trafford to face Manchester United. Yeah, of course that's going to be, you, you know, too bad it's not going to be on conventional television or otherwise the bars yeah, would be packed. Otherwise people would have talked about it and all the TV uh, TV shows that we watch on Sports Center or on Sports Net Central, which they don't even talk about the Champions League anymore. I know, and I have great thoughts. I don't have an issue with Dazone and, and how they cover in this, but I, I think that we're losing something this year by having it not available. By you know, you can't duck out of work early and go get a pub or go get a pint and watch a game. It's it, it is unfortunate, but that aside, this is a hell of a game. Um, you know, you guess you, the advantage of how it's going to be streaming is you can, if you have a team in the in the race like like I do, you can split screen it if you need, or you can go to some place that's going to have it streamed and, and have it on your phone or something. But um, Ronaldo coming back to Old Trafford is, is the story. Uh, he is, you know, a lot of people had hopes up until very the last minute that that United would sweep in and bring him quote unquote home. Yeah, uh, he, uh, that was never going to happen, anyways. <laughs> Well, they, they're not. They don't spend money that way anymore. They don't. Um, they have a very, very specific recruitment and strategy. They spend money, but to spend it in one player the way they do, they'd have to justify it uh, to you know people who aren't necessarily football people and, and wouldn't necessarily be romanticized by it. So this was never going to happen, as you say. Look, I. United is very tricky to sort of handicap this year because they they have looked good at times, to be honest, but. They also look terrible at times, and, and <laughs> yeah. we'll see. This should be an interesting one. Pogba versus his former club. Ronaldo versus his former, former club. So that that will be an interesting one. Before we say goodbye, just a confirmation that Tata Martino will leave Atlanta United at the end of the season. We all know where he's going. He's going to Mexico. Yeah, and... You know, I it's it's hard. I as people know, Kevin and I follow the U.S. men's national team as closely as, as anyone out there. But we are not Americans, so we don't have the same emotional sort of uh, blindness that when we do. So, but I still look at this, and I understand as an Amer- if you're an American observer, if you're an American who is an American U.S. men's national team fan, um, you got to be frustrated that they didn't even have a chat with this guy apparently because it it just seems absurd. Uh, he's willing to coach in, in CONCACAF. He came to MLS. You would think that he would have been open to a U.S. offer, and the U.S. did splash money for Klinsman before. <laughs> and he was Why coaching in the U.S. for the last two years. So, anyway. This, it, and Greg Berhalter, God love him, is not at the same <laughs> level. I mean, you know, we're talking, nope. we are our national team coach, coach the Canadian women. So, it's you know, we have a completely unique situation here. So, it's not that we're throwing stones in a glass house. We re- re- realize we're on a similar plane, but, <laughs> we but the, US should, right. the U.S. should be punching up, not, not down. And this seems like a punch down situation for them in terms of, of uh, that's a wrong analogy, but <laughs> yes, they're, yes they're, it's a wrong, it's just wrong. They're, they're, they're dipping women. down to get rather than, they're rather than rising their game up to go above their station, they're going down is what it seems like to me, is what I was trying to say. It's, <laughs> It's going to say it's Monday, but it's not even Monday. It's Tuesday. Everything is wrong, but what, every, what I'm saying now. <laughs> yes, and, uh, you know, Greg Berhalter just lost to Orlando. Let that sink in. Yeah, and he might miss the playoffs if the results don't go the right way next week. Yeah, we'll see. That's going to be a good topic of discussion for Friday. Anyways, as always, you can follow Dwayne on social media at 24th Minute. Myself at Kev Larme. We'll be back tomorrow with the coverage of the Champions League game of today and the news of the world of football with a soccer perspective. Until next time, you can catch our shows on podcast form at sportspodcastnetwork.com. Anywhere you get your podcast, make sure you're subscribed and you download all the latest episodes. And until next time, have a great soccer. You can find the podcast version of all the shows we do on iTunes, Apple Podcast, Google Play Store, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, and anywhere you get your podcast.